Uh, thank you for the um, invitation for this uh, interview. I'm very honored. Um, so my name is Carl Andriessen. I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for Mental Health at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. And my, my field of research broadly is about suicide prevention, but my own research um, focus is about bereavement after suicide and other traumatic deaths, and specifically bereavement in young people with regards to their grief, mental health, help seeking, and also effectiveness of service delivery. Um, right. Very important fields, I would imagine, especially uh, in these modern times where there's a lot of pressure to live, rising cost of living, etc. Your academic career has many highlights. Prior to your fellowship in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, what academic achievement would you say uh, you are most proud of? Um, it's a very difficult question because um, I've been involved in the field of suicide prevention and mental health uh, for about 30 years. And over the years, my let's say the focus of my work has been evolving. Um, but I guess that if, if I have to choose a few topics, I guess the work that I have been doing, for example, with regards to suicide prevention on railways, I, I, I think it was a very important and innovative way that we got in, in this type of research or in the field of research, because I think we were one of the first researchers that actually visited locations where people had died by suicide on the railway, and not just any location, but we focused on locations where multiple suicides had occurred. And we, we visited those locations with, uh, with a checklist, but also looked at the environment and tried to understand why particular locations were attractive for suicidal people. And uh, so we conducted this research when I was still uh, living and working in Belgium. Uh, but I, it was important because it informed the railway um, companies to think about how to approach suicide prevention on railways. And the work that we did uh, back 10, 15 years ago um, is still informing and is still be used by the railway company to, um, to safeguard railways and railway locations. So that was certainly um, something I look back with. Um, uh, which was important for suicide prevention. I think another important part of my work has been with regards to suicide prevention in the media, um, because I think not maybe not traditionally, but let's say the the usual way of how researchers and clinicians and also policymakers um, looked at media and suicide was try to find out risk factors in the media reporting and how certain risk factors may have increased the risk of imitation or copycat suicides in vulnerable people. And we found that it was a very difficult way of looking at media and suicide because it was hard to engage media and journalists when you were always telling them what they were doing wrong. And so with a few people, also including organizations of people bereaved by suicide, media organizations, professional bodies of journalists, policy makers, we installed a new, an award for appropriate reporting of suicide in the media. And this award was granted every year during an annual event. Um, we found it was rather successful because for the first time, journalists were not um, uh, told what they should do in regards to the reporting of uh, suicide in the media, but they were able to receive um, acknowledgement of 
positive work that they also did in regards to appropriate uh, reporting and collaborating with suicide prevention organizations or collaborating with media and, and mental health organizations. And so this award that we installed, I think it was already back 20 years ago, um, has been copied in other countries like in Denmark, but also in Australia. Um, so I think it was a, also something that I um, think was very useful as a piece of work, both research and 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 involving other uh, professional bodies. Well, cool. oh. if if I have to pick, probably the, the the type of work or the field of work that I've been most proud of, uh, probably is the work that I've been doing in the field of suicide bereavement support. Um, which is now also my major field of work. And um, I think there are also many achievements, not only from me personally, but also internationally, because originally, maybe 20, 30 years ago, the field of suicide bereavement was overlooked in the whole field of suicide prevention and mental health. And we with the work that we did, we tried to emphasize that people bereaved by suicide was not only important to provide them with support, not only because of the grief, but also because they themselves were also at risk of suicidal behavior or dying by suicide. And that providing support to them was not, not only a means of supporting them in the grief, but also as a means of suicide prevention and this notion of providing support to people grieved by suicide has now been widely accepted and has been included in, in national strategies for suicide prevention in Australia, but in, in many countries. And I think the, the potential for suicide prevention um, has increased by including the focus on people grieved by suicide. Yes, because like suicide it doesn't only affect the the actual person that attempts but it also even like suicide survivors it changes the dynamics between them and family members and friends as uh and it's very important work in your find your expert biography it describes a youth that is spent doing social work and family counseling. Uh, how and why did you enter this field? Were there inspirations from your family or friend group or perhaps a mentor? Um, well, actually it, 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 it went a bit different because now you talk back to 1985 and at that time there was still a, a compulsory conscription, like a military conscription. And um, which meant that all young men, 18 years and older, had to go to the army for 10 or 12 months. And there were a few exceptions, um, like medical reasons, but you could also apply for a status as a conscientious objector. And I applied for a status of conscientious objector. I also um, got a status um, which implied that you... Um, had to do a civil service of 20 or 24 months instead of going to uh, serving in the army. And so I uh, started to work in family and youth counseling um, during my compulsory civil service as a consensus objector. That's how I entered the field. And of course, while I was working then as a counselor, as a social worker, um, this, there I also had my first professional um, experiences with regards to suicidal behavior, self-harming behavior um, in young people, in family members. Um, but that's how I entered the field, in fact. I see. Mm. Uh, so during this uh, period of so um, civil service, I suppose, uh, you man cri uh, telephone crisis lines as you work as a social worker. What was an important takeaway from that experience, helping troubled individuals essentially with only your voice? 
Mm, yeah, so I worked for about 13 years in the Suicide Prevention Center um, as a telephone counselor, and I, I was also the director of the center uh, during the last three years that I have been working there. I think the most important thing that or I learned lots of things with regards to how to connect and how to talk with um, suicidal people while I was working there. But one of the things, as you mentioned, it's you, you only have your voice or you only have the telephone line um, for connecting with a suicidal person. What was important is that you are able to listen to what the person wants to share at that time, uh, because the person is reaching out to a telephone line. So maybe they are, they want to share something about their life, about their feelings, about their thoughts. And as a counselor or as a, also there have many volunteers in the service, um, it's important that you listen to what the person wants to say um, without judgment. So you can provide a safe space that the person can open up and maybe say things that they haven't told anyone before. And what is important for making the connection is that you do not only listen or try to listen at the factual information that the person is providing, but also what it means for the particular person or how they feel about it, what they are experiencing. For example, a person who is suicidal, very often they think in black and white terminology, like no one understands me, no one can help me. Um, and then, of course, one of the reactions could be, well, maybe if you feel alone, maybe look, look for some friends or maybe contact your family so you feel less alone. But that's not helpful for the person who is suicidal because they feel alone, even if they have people around them, even if they have family members even if they have friends or neighbors, but they are unable to connect with them or they feel disconnected. And then it's important to try to understand how do you feel about this while you are feeling alone and there is no one that understands you. So how do you, how do you cope with it? How do you do this? Because you are thinking about suicide and you maybe have making plans to end your life, but you are still here. So what does it mean for you if you say that you feel alone and no one understands you? And so you try to bridge the, the, the feelings that the person is experiencing, try to understand the feelings and what it means for the person rather than the factual information. And I found that a very important uh, lesson um, that I learned as a counselor um, while I was working there and, and communicating or trying to communicate with suicidal people, that it's not only about the, the factual level, but the emotional levels and the meanings that they experience. Mm 